rated A for your airplane. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to another workshop presentation here at EA Together, the Spirit of Aviation Week. My name is Mark Forrest, along with Joe Norris, and today we're going to be talking about wood construction. Wood construction is one of the very first methods of building airplanes. Right, exactly. It goes back to long before powered flight, uh, back in the days when the, everybody was just starting to experiment with gliders. Yeah. Everything was made out of wood and fabric because that was the readily available materials that they had. Right, there was no high-tech alloys <clears throat> of aluminum in those days. No. Uh, no composites, of course. No, not other than wood, which is yeah. nature's own composite. Well, it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Very much so. Yeah. So. Uh, because of that, because of that natural material, mm -hmm. that's where I mean, the, the wood aircraft construction started. Right. And it's really continued on for many, many years. Right, exactly. There's still, uh, you know, wood was very, very prominent in the early days of powered flight. Uh, a lot of your early aircraft were all wood and then wood and fabric. And then they started to incorporate metals as they became more prominent and more available. But wood was still very, very plentiful and very, very inexpensive. Uh, much more so even as far as plentiful goes, much more so than today because we can cut trees up a lot faster than we can grow them. Yes. So, uh, you know, but the, the woods we the used in aircraft were very plentiful at the time, very easy to, to uh, access and very easy to procure and simple to work with with the tools that they had available at the time. Sure. A lot of hand tools and some power tools as well, but um, the fact that it is so uh, workable with very basic tools is one of the things that makes it so appealing for building aircraft. Especially in the home built arena because you don't need sophisticated equipment, sophisticated machinery. And we're going back to like the early days of home building in the 20s and 30s right. where folks were building gliders, they were building uh, uh, powered airplanes as well. Right, you look at the very first, what we kind of consider the very first home built aircraft that was prominent at all was the Pete and Pole Air Camper. Yeah. And Bernard Pete and Pole built that entire aircraft out of wood. Uh, a fuselage, tail, wings, everything are wood, and then with fabric covering on the wings sure. and tail, of course. And um, what was a Model A engine? Model A engine. Model yep, A engine. Yep. So and, you know, bicycle wheels. I mean, it, it literally was the true scrounging home builder. They, you know, materials are ready available in the local area and were inexpensive, easy to work with, easy to work on, and that's how the the home building movement really kind of got its start. And then it just blossomed from there. Exactly. And there's still, again, there's uh, there's kind of two paths to wood construction or wood aircraft today. There's restoration of those classic airplanes that we're talking about. Right. But there's still you can still build a, an entire wood airplane, be it a wood fabric or steel tube fuselage or maybe like a monocot structure like a Falco sure. or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. You look at. I mean, the Falco uh, looks very much like any modern aircraft when you look at the aircraft sitting on the ramp. It, it could be made out of metal or composite or whatever. But when yeah. you walk up the aircraft and really look at it it is an entire wood constructed aircraft a very high performance a very gorgeous airplane all made out of wood and of course uh, a lot of your aerobatic airplanes your pit specials your eagle biplanes and even some of the aerobatic monoplanes and some of the racers that you see like maybe at reno wood wings tube and fabric fuselage sure. lots of that going on and of course like you say with the restoration uh, your antique biplanes and many of your early antique monoplanes even a lot of wood in those as well so something that uh, either you're coming at it from the restoration side or the home building side you're gonna run into a, a variety of aircraft that you could get involved with that have wood construction sure one of the things that amazed me is when I walked through the EA museum here when I first started way way back when mm -hmm. was seeing the mosquito bomber yes and that's an almost entirely wood airplane. Yes, exactly. Hard to believe. In and fact, it, some of the wood came from Oshkosh area. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> true. Uh, they, we had good supply of wood here, and, and de Havilland that was building the Mosquito uh, used the sourced wood right here in the local area of Oshkosh. But yeah, that entire airframe is primarily wood, as was the uh, Spitfire, which is a very prominent sure. aircraft in World War II uh, in the British uh, Royal Air Force. Spitfire is, is very primarily wood. Uh, is, you know, so it's, some pretty high performance stuff can be built out of wood. It's, it's not just for the little you know, flutter bugs that fly around the patch like you think of like a peat and pole or sure, something yeah, like that. Sure, yeah, tube and fabric or yeah. a wooden fabric airplane. So it really runs the spectrum all the way from those low powered, very just more or less recreational type aircraft all the way up to something as, as high performance as the Mosquito or the Spitfire. And, and in many ways, it was also the origin of some of the original composite aircraft too. Uh, the KR series aircraft was a hybrid of wood and composite right. materials. Right. Uh, Bert Rutan, when he started developing his series of home built aircraft, the very big and one of the first was primarily wood. And then as they were working through the design and just the workflows of building composite materials, 
it became a, a hybrid of wood and composite and a little bit of everything. Right, and then he moved on into his moldless composite and, and all of the very recognizable Rutan aircraft that we know today. Yeah, you know, uh, we're all started by you know by a wood construction. So it's really amazing stuff. It is, and it's, again, readily available, easy to work with, easy to use with mm -hmm. some simple tools, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's long lasting too. I mean, you were telling the story the other day about some of the restorations we were doing over at the Kermit Weekend. Yeah, exactly. We uh, we have an aircraft that many of you have been to Oshkosh might have come to Pioneer Airport and taken a ride in our uh, Traveler biplane. Yeah. It's a 1929 airplane. Uh, the wings in that aircraft are wood construction, fabric covered, and we just had the opportunity over this last winter to uncover the lower wings and put uh, new fabric on those wings. And the original wood that was built in 1929 is still in there, still with the original coatings on them, and they look just as new as they were the day that they put that airplane together. The original fa factory markings are still legible. Uh, it was in very good shape, in very little repair at all on the structure, just new fabric. It's amazing. It is. As really. long as you take care of it, as long as you properly preserve it, right. it can be a very long-lasting structure. Absolutely, yep. and easy to repair as well, so it has a lot of good benefits. Just amazing stuff, it there's is. no doubt about it. It is. So when we talk about wood airplanes, mm -hmm. you know, wood is kind of such a generic term. There's many different species of wood, many different right. types of wood. There's just wood, yeah. wood timbers, and yep. then there's uh, plywood and everything like that. So right. we can't necessarily take a, a chunk of two by four and cut it up and build an airplane. Well, technically we could. Legally we could, but it might not, be the, might not be the smartest thing to do. <laughs> well, exactly, uh, but I mean, but so, it could so, be done. so what do we do? What kinds of woods right. do we use? Um, well, because of, of the, the kind of the history of wood back in World War I and yeah. even in the, in the middle of the, between the war years, a lot of the military aircraft were built out of wood, especially okay. the wings, by, you know, biplane fighters, you remember from, like I say, World War I and even yeah. into the uh, late 30s, uh, they had the biplane fighters. Those were wood wings in there. Sure. And, and in the and, trainers like the Jenny, for example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so they, the military had military specifications for the woods that they used that they, they had tested and, and you know, spec'd out what they needed for uh, the strength and the, the weight and the longevity and all that stuff. And they have an actual mill spec. It's, it's obsolete now because the military doesn't use wood in aircraft anymore. Sure, but, but it's, it's a guide. Still, it's still available online. You can still find that mill spec for wood. Yep. And uh, it is a guide for how to select proper woods for your aircraft construction. And a lot of that information was also transferred into our current advisory circular 4313 which uh, is titled Acceptable Methods, Techniques, and Practices. And that, if you look at that entire uh, advisory circular, which is about two inches thick in yeah. the printed form, right. it covers everything from wood to metal to electrical, um, hardware, you know, basically all the different facets of aircraft construction and maintenance. But there is a section in there specifically on wood. And a lot of that information that was originally in that mill spec is, is has in been that, transferred over. Right. And so you can look at that uh, 4313 advisory circular and you can get a lot of good information about wood it talks about grain and and you know how to cut it how to uh, join it you know different materials for preserving it all these different things are in that advisory circular and that advisory circular is is available online you know, sure. you, have to, you can buy a printed copy and you'll get the whole two inch thick book or you can download or it you, but the key is you can go to the FA website and you can download each individual chapter oh sure so if you just want the chapter on wood you can just get the chapter on wood or if you just want hardware or whatever yeah. so you don't have to buy the whole book I find it handy to have the book because you take it out to the shop with you and you lay it on the bench yeah. and you can just look up Page something through it, yeah. not have to go back to the computer and search or whatever exactly um, it's also nice to have the, the digital one because you can just print out pages if you just want a specific page that you sure, want to reference as a reference something. point yeah, when you're so, doing something so specific, it can yeah. it can uh, it can be either either or there but the information is out there is the key you can you still find good solid information on wood construction of aircraft so what's the primary material the primary style of wood that's being used today and or has been the used? traditional the traditional wood that that was really the job one was uh, Sitka spruce okay uh, came from the West Coast and up in Alaska yeah. primarily. Uh, that's still the first choice if you can find it. The problem is, again, as I mentioned, we can cut down trees a lot quicker than we can yeah. grow them. So it's getting to be a little bit more rare to find really good Sitka spruce, especially longer boards if you want to make spars or something like that. I've heard that they're reclaiming some of the old like fish cannery houses up in Alaska and the Northwest because they were made of spruce, yep. a readily, readily, readily available material in At that area, time, yep. and beautiful boards 
right. uh, fairly well preserved, and now they're taking, as they take down those buildings, they're reclaiming they them for use other it. uses. Like, exactly, yeah. yeah. They're, every place they can find a good piece of spruce, they're doing it, because sure. uh, aircraft industry and then also the music industry uses it as well, so it's, it's sought after uh, material. But uh, there are other options as well. Um, okay. They've looked at a lot of Douglas fir uh, for aircraft construction. Um, that's that's kind of number two behind the wood. It's a little bit heavier uh, weight-wise, sure. but similar in strength. So they've gone with Douglas fir a lot. And there's even, you'll find some applications, depending on the, what structure you're creating, you can, you'll can you see some ash and some other uh, some other woods as well. So there are other options. Other, other options, but yeah. I, if you can get spruce, that's... That's all of the, if you go back to the legacy home builds that were primarily wood aircraft, they were all based on the spruce. And if you want to use, substitute other woods, you, you kind of got to, do the math to figure out where the strength weight ratio lays to sure. come up with the proper uh, right you know, the proper strength part. It's kind of, kind of like substituting newer composite materials for legacy composite materials. Exactly. You got to kind of fit in the picture Fine, in yeah. terms of a, the specific physical properties to make it work properly. Right, exactly. But there are, there are lots of options out there. And again, as you mentioned in the experimental world, we have the latitude that we can experiment a little bit with yeah. these things. You know, so um, you know, it's always good to use tried and true. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, all, always base your experiments on. And other experiments that were gone before you and, and get as much data as you can. Usually a lot more successful. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, so, so there's, a, the, you know, the spruce is out there. Uh, it's still uh, available. And So, so uh, we've got a, an example of a, a piece of spruce. This right is there. a quarter by quarter inch uh, cap strip. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can buy it like this already pre- Pre-cut. Uh, Pre-cut yep. to the size you need, or mm -hmm. you can buy larger boards and then cut them yourself. Exactly. Uh, what's nice about, again, you, you talked about the specifications, so mm -hmm. we're, we are kind of like grading or evaluating the material, looking mm -hmm. for knots and, and right. pitch yeah. pockets and yep. things like uh, that. Grain structure. The grain structure and everything. Right. Exactly. Uh, getting it from a, a, a a good supplier like Aircraft, Aircraft Spruce, Spruce, and that's where they got, that's their, where they name got their name because that was their first product. Exactly. Yep. Uh, they've done some of that for you already. Right. Uh, and uh, so you, you're more assured of getting s uh, some higher quality, quality material wood. than sourcing it from a direct lumber right. supplier. For right. Example. And some lumber suppliers are savvy to that. And you know, I know that uh, I've talked to some builders in various areas that have a real good lumber supplier that has access to quality woods and they can get it locally. But that's not always the case. So yeah. you, you can always go to the, the aircraft sources, aircraft spruce and wicks and those and yeah and you'll get good quality it wood. makes perfect sense that way so we have the the solid pieces of wood mm -hmm. as one of our building blocks for building a wood airplane right so there's another building block as well and that would be plywood right, right exactly so plywood is a, this is not your Home Depot style plywood. No, you know, when, when in common conversation, when somebody mentions plywood, you immediately think of an eight, uh, you know, four by eight sheet of probably, you know, three eighths thick or maybe half yeah. inch thick, um, you know, five ply plywood. What you're holding in your hands there is, you know, that's uh, what, a sixteenth thick, maybe not even. Barely, and yeah. And that's mm -hmm. three ply. I mean, so those plies are ultra, ultra thin. But they are plywood, so it does have the cross grain structure that you want for the yeah. strength to weight ratio. And it's a beautiful piece it's of plywood. It's a beautiful, I mean, it's gorgeous wood, very flexible, very strong for, again, because it's plywood, it's very yeah. strong for its weight. And uh, so you can get that type of plywood. Uh, some of the sheeting that you would use, like to sheet a wing, like on a cassette racer, or maybe sure. on that Falco I was talking about, would be a little bit thicker than this, but it would also be probably a five ply, maybe even a seven ply. Mm -hmm. um, and just gorgeous pieces of wood you can find. And it's marine plywood. Uh, the, the adhesives that are used to bond the plies are waterproof adhesives. Obviously, sure. we're going to treat that wood, so we hope that water wouldn't get in there. Yeah, right. But if you did get a breach in the treatment, maybe something got scratched or damaged on a landing or something, Yeah. if that moisture gets in there, it doesn't immediately start breaking down the, the adhesives. Uh, the adhesives are made to withstand that sure. uh, withstand that uh, uh -huh. that environmental uh, issue. I mean, and we call it marine plywood, obviously, because it came from the boat building industry initially. Yeah, right, and that's a big source because boat building is kind of a outpacing home built wood home built yeah i mean of course boats have been around longer than airplanes and they yeah. a lot of this stuff was figured out initially by the the boat sure so we just kind of tail on to that and yeah, it exactly. works out quite nicely exactly and it's a, it's amazing you know when you look at a piece of plywood essentially thin sheets of veneers of, of wood yeah. that are glued together right uh, all the different patterns that you can get in terms of strength you can get mm. uh plywood that has a a, a structure that makes it 
easy to bend. Right. So if you're going over like a leading edge or if you're creating a cowling or something like that, right. it's it's fairly easy to, to yeah. form those complex shapes. Exactly, yeah. The, the something more, you can't do with sheet metal very easily. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, in, depending on the application, wood can be actually a much more uh, easy to work with material than even sheet metal can. Mm -hmm. so. Really neat stuff. Yeah, exactly. So we have plywood, we have our larger pieces of yep. wood, mm -hmm. and then we kind of kind of put it all together. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so how, in, in terms of wood, we talked about tools being very, very simple. Mm -hmm. It's yep. really not that challenging right. to set up your shop for tools. Exactly. To, yeah. to do wood. Mostly, it's, to sheet mostly it's, it's common carpenter type tools. Yeah. And in the smaller stuff, you might get down to modeler size tools, some smaller saws yeah. and some smaller files and stuff like that. But it's, it's uh, uh, typically either your local hobby shop or your local hardware store will be able to supply you every tool you'd need to build a wood airplane. So what I found is people are fairly comfortable making wood Airplanes, yes. working on wood yeah, construction. Yeah, typically, typically a lot, done of, it before. a lot of yeah, a lot of people have done some carpentry, maybe at their home, or maybe they built simple furniture, or sure. have done some kind of you know working with wood is something that's fairly common in the family. Or even a balsa wood airplane. Yeah, and, and or even just building a, models. It's yeah. a smaller scale. That's all. Very true. Very true. And, yeah. But the materials and the techniques, the processes are very similar. Very just much scaled so. up. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. So and, you know when we're talking about uh, tools, uh, some of the tools that we have set up here. Uh, we have a saw, yep, a, little, a tiny little saw little to, to cut the saw, uh, yep. strip. So mm -hmm. these saws are really nice. These are actually made for uh, uh, model trains to cut the uh, tracks for the train. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it's a very fine, very thin, almost like a hacksaw mm -hmm. that works really, really nice for doing fine cuts on, on wood. Yeah, nice clean cuts. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have some other things like uh, a staple gun, yep. which is actually used as a clamp, and we'll show, show yeah, everyone we'll show how, how you do, do that. that a little yep. bit later on. But mm -hmm. a simple staple gun, again, very inexpensive. Uh, another important tool, yep. pair of scissors. scissors. And again, nothing special about yep. that. We actually use that, the scissors, to cut the plywood because the, the plywood is so thin, you don't have to cut it with any kind of real heavy duty nope. uh, cutting tools. We can just use a simple scissors to yep. cut that and to trim that pretty much any way we want to. Just something like that. Yeah, exactly. But beyond that, I mean, there are some nice, uh, a little more advanced tools that are nice for woodworking. Yeah. Um, uh, one I found is a bandsaw. Yes, yeah, bandsaw for can cutting be very shapes. Handy. Yep. And yeah, a bandsaw is handy if you've got access to one. Another one is a a, a small power sander, like yeah. a, like a one inch belt sander. One inch belt sander. Works or really a small great. disc sander sometimes comes yeah. in handy as well. And a lot of uh, the you go to the different. Uh, tool outlets and you might actually find a combination machine that has a one inch belt Bel sander and, and, a and the disc, disc sander yeah. all driven by the same motor and standing on the same stand so you get two tools for the price of one. And that makes quick work of sanding and trimming. Yeah, you know, otherwise you're doing that by shapes. hand. Yep. You'll have to take a, a piece of sandpaper and yeah, shape, your, shape your wood by hand. Yep either on, with a block or just by hand. So the, the, the one inch belt sander, yep. I, again, just speeds things up. Right, takes, exactly. Makes the process quicker. Exactly. The belt, uh, pardon me, the, the uh, bandsaw is nice for cutting complex shapes. So here's an example of a nose piece that would go on a wing rib. We're gonna mm. actually use this when we build a wing rib here in just a few minutes. Yep. This particular piece was laser cut, mm -hmm. but this could add, Easily been cut out using a bandsaw. Yep, bandsaw, and then uh, you know make a rough cut to get in here, and then my favorite tool, the Dremel tool, can be used to to finish out that tight inner. Uh, you got to uh, have a Dremel tool. If you don't have a Dremel tool already, buy two. Yeah, <laughs> they are they are the handiest. I mean, I don't uh, care whether you're building airplanes or working on anything in the home. A uh, Dremel tool I've found is to be an incredibly yeah. uh, versatile piece of equipment. I still have mine from grade school. Believe yep, it or not. I have yeah, I have my first one as well, and it's still going strong. Yep. So. Uh, Band, a bandsaw or even a router, if you'd yep. want to, could yep. you cut yep. out this complex shape. Yep. Uh, the kit manufacturers that are still producing wooden aircraft are, help you a bit because a lot of times the parts be laser cut like yep. this. So this right. particular uh, piece was laser cut. Mm -hmm. uh, makes it really easy because yep. then you get a, a whole bag of parts already done. Here's actually a That's panel, the actual panel of what's of, left over. Yep, a bunch cut. of nose ribs when you put it in a laser cutter and you can just cut out all those nose ribs just yep. like that out of one sheet. Now that's again plywood uh, so that's uh, it's quarter inch wide looks like one two three four five ply in this case five ply marine plywood very, yeah. very good looking piece of wood even at that sure and then you easily cut those pieces out of it and, and away you go. Yeah, now not everyone has a laser cutter, nope. but the, what what is uh, makes it 
faster for us in terms of home builders is most of the manufacturers are getting onto that bandwagon right. with laser cutting, CNC machining, pre-producing those challenging yeah, contoured parts that take a lot of time. Parts. I yeah, mean, it's exactly. a, lot e a lot harder, it takes a lot more time to cut this out as compared to cutting yep. a stick at yep. a certain length. Exactly. So it just helps the process and makes it faster, gets us in the air quicker. Exactly. And repeatability, because they're all exactly They're all exactly the same, the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, once you get your, your raw materials there and some of your other parts cut out, you have to have a way to put them all together in the proper size and shape and, and dimensions. And so we start looking at building jigs. Yeah, and, and we've again, got some examples of those that. Those are also built out of, amazingly enough, wood. Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Something is very simple to, to do, and this, this particular jig we have here, right is, here. Our, is our rib jig for building a wing rib and this is just a piece of particle board Yep. and we use some scrap pieces of our same quarter inch uh, spruce there or you could sure. make these blocks out of anything really scrap. Yeah, see that they're kind of glued yeah. down or you, you could, stapled you in. You could saw those out of your 2 by 4 if you wanted there to because they're just there to hold other parts in place and then uh, since we're going to be using some adhesive on this uh, we don't want to glue our parts into our jig. Yes. So we need to protect this jig and treat it so that it it has a uh, releasability and normally you do that uh, the old world way is to do it with like linseed oil sure soak the the, the uh, so the glue don't stick exactly and nowadays you can use ma many different release agents you can uh, the wax agents various different things you can use that will do I've seen people job. actually use like furniture spray Ex furniture wax yep, exactly anything like that so that it, the, it, the the glue doesn't stick yeah because when you put your uh, parts on there you're gonna have a little bit of, of squeeze you know squeeze out it's gonna yeah. run down on the jig and you don't want to sit there and have to try to pry your part out of the jig after right. you've just completed it. So Yeah, so you can't, I mean when you're building an airplane you want repeatability, you want everything to look the same. So here's an example of a wing rib that was already done Built in this right particular in that jig. jig. Yeah. And you need, you know, 20, 30 of these yep. and you want them to be all the same. Exactly. And you can't just kind of freehand that. No. So the jig, the fixture allows you to do that and every single one's the same. Right. Now that's with most airplanes. If, if you have an airplane that has a tapered wing, then mm -hmm. you're going to be building a lot of jigs. Right. Because you'll, you'll have two ribs the same, one on each wing, and yeah. then you'll maybe have another one that's a few inches shorter, and then another one. You know, so you you build a, a jig for a, each pair of ribs. Sure. So you can get into a, you know if it's a higher performance airplane with a tapered wing like that, you do get into a little bit more jig building or, yep. or fixture building and you also will build fixtures for the fuselage as yeah. well if you're building a wood fuselage. I mean for all the all the component parts basically. Yeah. But again you're going to use your basic home tools I mean if you square up a fuselage you're going to use a carpenter square yeah. and some wire to hold it in place while you glue the parts together mm -hmm. and it's just very simple stuff that you get at your at your local store. So yeah. It's really really easy to. I mean uh, this is one of the most simplest ways to build an airplane and again it's, it's like building a big balsa model. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is exactly the same. If anybody that's been involved with model building over the years, this is going to, you know, be right. They'll right know up, that right yeah, away. Right yeah. up the same alley for sure. Some other kind of auxiliary tools that we build with scrap materials are something like this. So this is just a, a piece of uh, particle board mm -hmm. with some plywood pieces glued and stapled to it mm -hmm. at various angles. And on the back of that, we have another piece of wood, and that acts as a third hand because what we can do is put it against the bench right. and then use it as a third hand to help to hold, hold the materials while we cut them. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to cut this at this particular angle right here. So now instead of holding like this and it's moving all over the place, mm -hmm. we have a nice firm grip and a reference angle to cut this wood. And it makes for a for quick work yep. of that real and simple. again repeatability. Yep, real simple. Yep. So that's a, a, a nice tool to have. Mm -hmm. Another thing we have constructed when we are building ribs is you're going to be building what's called gusset plates, thin yep. pieces of plywood that are glued to the intersections. Yep, that's what we're talking about. Right These here. right here. Yeah. So those are uh, help to, to carry the stress from all the different members of the rib and, and consolidate those and keep your structure uh, integrity. Yep. And so those are all because of the different locations, they have to be various different sizes. And so as you're holding that, I'm going to go over here and grab my pencil. Okay. And this little fixture allows you to cut multiple pieces of that, of a particular size. So we just mark it off with the pencil. We hold it in the, the fixture, mark it off with the pencil, and then take our scissors and snip, just like this. 
and yeah. instant part. Exactly. And you can go through and snip off several hundred right. of those, so you have a pile of yep, you can one make, size, a pile of the other yep, size. You can get a bunch of cups or, or uh, little cans or something, and you can label each one. As you notice, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but we've numbered this jig so that all the different uh, sizes of gussets, we know exactly where they go and how many we need. Sure. And you can just make cups full of number one gusset, number two gusset, number three gusset. You can cut them all out, you know, cut them all out ahead of yeah. time, and then when you go to assemble your rib, you just grab the right one, and you don't have to stop and cut each one individually. Sure. So yep. it makes it really handy to do that. Makes it really easy. Streamlines yep. the whole process again. Yep. Uh, so things like that are, are helpful when you're building uh, a wood aircraft. Mm -hmm. I mean, other simple tools, I mean, sandpaper. Yep, got to have needs, sandpaper. Need sandpaper. And then we use uh, various special adhesives to hold things together. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. So when we start building our airplane, when we're, we have the wood, mm -hmm. there are certain grain and mm -hmm. orientations that we have to follow. Right, right? And exactly. basically you're following the designer's recommendations. Right, yeah, typically if they have a specific way that they want you to put the grain uh, in a structure, they'll call that out. Sure. Uh, but a lot of ways it's a little bit common sense. Uh, like for instance, this upper cap strip on this rib is yeah. slightly curved. Yes. So you want to you want to put the wood in so that you can bend it with the grain, not yep. against the grain, because it's going to be easier to form that into that into sure. that uh, into that structure. Now this one's not curved a lot. Some wings have more curve, and it makes them. In fact, there's some that have so much curve that uh, it's really hard to put the stress on the wood. Dry. Dry. And you'll actually soak the wood in water. Sure. And then put it in a little clamp block and let it dry in that curved shape that you okay. want. So it's much easier to kind of ease in. it into yeah, much easier to fit it in the jig than trying to bend it while you're. You know, sure. And th this one's not bent enough to worry about that, but some of them with a really highly curved structure, you'd have to do that. It helps to, yeah. to actually pre soak like on a fuselage or something. Right. You're yeah. Doing a kind former, of a complex shape. Former mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. So so there are ways that you can work with the wood. And again, very simple. Uh, some hot water which you can create at your house yeah. and soak the wood, get it nice and warm and wet, and then you put it in, a, a, in your jig or, and just let it dry and it'll, it'll and, maintain and It just that makes shape. it more workable when you're exactly. putting it together. Exactly. So, yeah. Really handy. So we've, we've, uh, we select the wood, yep. we determine wh which way we have to cut it, right. lay it out yep. and then cut it. Yep. And usually what we're doing is, especially like on the, on the plywood pieces, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll uh, do the layout in the plywood, mm -hmm. we'll cut it with a bandsaw, rough cut it, yep. and then fine tune the cut line with the belt sander. With your belt sander or maybe even a hand even sander. A hand it's a sander. very light, you know, if you've got a very light adjustment to make, you just yep. do it by hand. If you've got a, a little bit more work to do around the entire periphery, you yep. go on your belt sander or get your Dremel tool out for that sure. inner radius there. And then uh, you get it down to your final shape. And what I usually do on the, uh, something like this, if I was going to make a bunch of these rib blocks and I wasn't going to use the laser cutter, laser cutter. That, I don't, that I don't have, <laughs> yeah, right. um, I would make a, a take, get a piece of scrap aluminum and I would make a, an aluminum template. For oh, this. sure. Mm -hmm. And that way I can cut you know, a rough block of wood, lay my template on and draw the lines. And then I know that everyone's going to follow that exact same shape because I've got my metal template. Sure. And then I can take it on my belt sander and I can, you know, just work it right down to that line. And then I can put my template on there and make sure, yep, that's the shape I need. Yep. And away you go. And so really suddenly simple. you have a whole bunch of parts. Yeah, got a whole stack. You know, got a whole uh, bunch of cups of, uh, of gussets and you got a whole stack of, of nose ribs and you got your jig ready to go and you're ready to put some ribs together. So now it's time to build an airplane. Exactly. So let's, let's start that. Yeah, so what we're, uh, what we're gonna start with is we're gonna take our nose rib here and we're gonna just put that in the jig as kind of a starting place. And we, we've got our jig made so we know that that's gonna fit right in there. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make our two uh, cap strips, our upper and lower cap strips. Sure. So we're going to start with a you know piece of wood. Yeah. And we've already uh, we know which uh, what size it is and the, where the grain's going and everything. We're going to just put that in there and we're going to follow it around, drop it in our jig all the way along, and then look at that—it's too long on the end there. Well, of course, son of a gun. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do on that is I'm going to take my little saw here. And very carefully, I'm going to look straight down on that, and I'm going to line up the edge of that cap strip with my jig block. I'm going to make a mark in my wood so that I've got my length that I want. And I'm going to pull it out of there, and I'm going to put it in my little fixture here so that I can hold that in place while I do my sawing. And boom. Just like that, a few swipes of the saw. Now this is a place where 
Well, actually, I did it pretty good. Sometimes it might still be a little long just because you're looking that at it. That worked out just right. Just take your sandpaper and clean it out, and you're in good shape. So there's your first cap strip. And speaking about that in terms of dimensioning and mm -hmm. things, okay, yep. uh, we're not building a Swiss watch. No. You don't have to measure these things to a thousandth of an inch. Not at all. But there are some, some general guidelines you need to follow when you're fitting up the wood parts. Mm -hmm. It can't be really super tight, but it can't be really loose either. Right, right? exactly, because it, these are all going to be held together with adhesive. Yes. So you have to have a little bit of room for the adhesive to actually get in there and do its job. Yep. But you don't want such a large gap that the, the adhesive becomes part of the structure. It's just to hold it together. It's not to become the structure. The so, structure, yeah, sure. So you don't want huge gaps. You want to be fairly well fitted um, so that there's just a, a slight gap there for that adhesive to go in there and do its work. So okay. it, it takes some careful fitting, but it just take your time. Is basically it's what a bit of practice, to, yeah. yeah. So now we've got our, our upper cap strip, and now we're going to look and check my grain. I want to go this way. I'm going to put my lower cap strip in, and uh, look at that. That's not going to fit, is it? So first of all, I'm going to do two cuts on this one. I'm, first, I'm going to cut it to length. So I'm going to mark my length again, just like I did on my other one. There we go. Put that in my little cutting jig here. A few swipes of the saw and we'll have that cut off. These like little that. saws work really well. Oh, nice. the saws are sweet, aren't they? Now, um, there's always a debate on whether I want the to trim the upper one or the lower one. Yeah. And it doesn't matter because there's going to be a gusset go over top of that and it's all going to become one unit. One unit, so, so it doesn't. So yeah. you can pretty well decide which way you want to go, and I'm just gonna switch these and I'm going to put the, the put one on top yeah, that uses and, a template yeah, or a and guide, then right? Then I'm going to just take a look at here and just take a real rough estimate of where that angle is. And again, this will be cleaned up later with, with uh, some sandpaper. I'll make a mark in there. I'm going to take that out. I think I'll put it, where'd it go? I lost my mark all of a sudden. I just had it a minute ago. There it is. There it is. It's hard to see in the lights. Yeah, it is. The lights are messing me up. I'm going to stick that in there. I have you help hold that a little bit. Do it right handed, which is difficult for me, but I'm going to do it anyway. Move it down just a little bit. There we go. I love working with wood. It's such a relaxing thing. You know, you're working with this organic material. We were talking about this the other day. It's, you know, it, when you're working with wood, 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 you're going back in time and yeah, it's fun to put on like big band music or stuff yep, like that. Yep. To Get in, in the mood. In the mood. <laughs> <laughs> there. Great. Look at that. So a little bit of gap, but easily. Yep, yeah, this will just enough for the. Uh, yeah, this will come together and we'll put our gusset yep. on there and we'll be in good Great. shape. So there we got our two um, cap strips. So now we start with some of the. Now we, now we, yep, now we take an, uh, the rest of our wood here and save these little scraps because like for instance I can use You'll fit I could use somewhere. that little scrap to make this part of this sure. little, so don't throw those away right away okay cuz those could come in handy for the longer ones we'll just uh, get our other piece of wood here and this is that one's actually it just works about pretty the, well just about the, the right shape right there and then if you want to go ahead and look at that mark sure. and because you're left a lefty over there like I am so you can get in there and mark that two lefties are right huh? yeah that's right just be careful you don't cut into our, okay. our lingerie on there or our uh, cap strip. We'll continue the cut. Yep. Okay. And see how that see fits how that in. that fits in there. Look at that. It's like downtown. Just right. So let's go ahead and make another one right back here. Just like that. And so you can get an eyeball on that one there. There you go. Our little third hand here to hold it. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's hard to see, but what I'm doing is I'm trying to keep that blade perpendicular. Exactly. You don't yeah. want to cut it at an angle unless you need to yeah, cut it at an angle. There might be a reason to, which yeah. is why we have our angled uh, templates right. there. See how that one works? Just right. Look at that, just like it was made to go there. Well, wait, wait a minute, it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, now, now the fun part, the yeah, diagonal. Is get that diagonal in there. So um, this would be a place where, if I was in my home shop, I would probably take this on my belt sander and yeah. just do a nice little point on that that would fit right in there. Because we're gonna yep. have to. We're gonna have to. Yeah, because there's a, there's yep. literally two cuts. There's the yep. cut here yep. that we have to fit, and then the cut on the yeah, uh, cause, upright. Because to be very to be very technical, the center line of this all these 
uh, units should come intersect cross, cross one that dot. point because yeah. that, mm -hmm. that's the way it carries the load the best. Yep. So I'm going to yeah, and essentially you're building a bridge, yep. a truss yep. structure. Is, is a, is, is, all this is is a truss exactly. So what I would do in this case is I would cut this a little bit long, and then I could trim my edges to fit. Sure. So I'm going to mark this right about here. There we go. Over here in our third hand. That little saw just goes right through there, just like that. All right, so now I'm, I'm close. And you see, actually, I cut it a little bit short. Now, technically, I would, if I was going to build this part, I would probably remake that. Yeah. But I have looked at a lot of factory-built aircraft from the uh, 30s. Yeah. And because they're building in, in volume and they don't and have as time quickly to as they can. fiddle around making parts, they would actually, that would be good enough because the gusset is going to carry that load. Yeah, so if we look at this, we have the everything intersecting, but the, the gusset takes precedence because the, you're covering so yep. much more area on each one. Right, exactly. And, and the adhesives are going to be holding things together. Right, and right. It makes for a really strong joint. Yep, so me being a fussy home builder, I would take time to make this part again and, and make that fit just a little bit better. Than sure. That. For the purposes of our demonstration, we'll use the one we, we yeah. made here. So. So, and of course you would continue back and do another upright here and another one here and another diagonal and you get all those parts in there all laid out and then you'd get ready to, to glue them together. actually do your, your uh, adhesive. So when we're gluing these parts, so we have all the parts cut, mm -hmm. okay, we're just doing a, a small portion yep, of this, but right. we'd, we'd have everything cut and fitted and then uh, we would get some gusset plates yep. cut. So basically we're just going to take some gusset plates, some gusset plates material and we're going to use our rib that we have already constructed as a bit of a guide in terms of the size so of the gusset one's plate. going to go right there. there. Right there, and then... Uh, a smaller one for, uh, or actually the same size probably for here. Let's That's cut a, a piece there. That's a number six, so if we look at, our, look at our guide here, we want to get a number six, which looks like... Uh, there it is right yeah, there. Maybe that one, yep. So I'll mark that, and then cut it. Mm -hmm. So we have a six, mm -hmm. and then we need a two, and the two's a little right. shorter. Yeah, yeah, we've got a two couple, twos. couple of twos that we would need if we wanted to complete this yep. part of the structure right there. We'll get those four in. I think we'll have time for that. Mm-hmm. Cutting away here. Mm -hmm. Such a simple thing with it's the scissors. It's so easy, yep. Yeah. So easy. It's like cutting cardboard almost. Yep, but yep. so this one will go like this. I'm going to turn that over. Now another thing, um, another thing that you can do if you're, if you just like it to look pretty, but nobody's going to see these once you put the fabric over the wing. Yeah. But, but the, you know, bu home builders being home builders are always like to make everything just right and they're, they're you know, yeah. particular. Sure. So you could, if you wanted to, you could trim this gusset off uh, oh, uh, on an angle there because it only needs to contact the two uh, structure, this, this part that's yeah. sticking out here. And I've seen that where they've yeah. cut, cut yeah. the Or, or this, this one you'd do a triangle right yeah, here. Sure. Uh, this one, that one would stay the way it is because it covers all the structure sure. there. Yeah. This one really only needs to go that, well it's got a it's got a diagonal coming this way so that would have another. And besides part. the look you're actually saving a teeny bit a of weight. A little bit of weight, yep. So yeah. you can trim them off if you want. Um, doesn't make any difference structurally. Yeah. It's not any stronger or any weaker if you trim them or don't trim them. Yeah. There's a very, very slight difference in the weight is the only thing that you're gonna gain. Okay, so, so now we have the parts. Yep. And we have to put them together. Yep. So we can't use Elmer's glue for this, can no, we? No, <laughs> it's probably not the best because that's water soluble for one thing. Exactly. <laughs> So what we typically do is use, in this day and age, we use the two-part epoxies. It's sure. the most common that you'll see in the home-built industry. Right. Um, because it's easy to work with, it's, it's easily procurable, uh, and it's very forgiving as far as temperature and uh, workability and all that stuff. Now, if you're working on a restoration... So of, that, was, that was what I was going to say. There's, yeah. there's two paths here. Right. If you're restoring an aircraft or you're building a home build. So right. let's talk about restoration. If you're working on a standard category airplane, you're restoring our travel air or sure. a Belenka that has a wood wing yeah. or, or something like that, uh, you have to use FAA approved components, mm -hmm. which the only uh, currently available 
uh, adhesive that is FAA approved for standard category airplanes is resorcinol. Okay, and which, which is an old school. Is, yeah, it's been around for forever. since the 30s. Yeah? yeah, and there was actually some other materials they used back then, casein glues and stuff that are basically obsolete at this yeah. point. But resorcinol is really still the only approved. Um, adhesive for wood type structure certified. and type certified airplanes. So sure. uh, the thing about resource and all is that it is more critical on fit. You have to be much more careful on getting everything to fit just right. It's a thinner material. It's a very, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's more like, it's more watery than, sure. whereas this stuff is more uh, like a thick paste almost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you have to be a little bit more critical on the fit and it's a little more, more critical on temperature, working temperature. Okay. Um, so you just know your product and, and you know work accordingly. Yeah. So in the home boat world, though, we have a little more latitude in terms of materials we can use. True. We still want to use good stuff. Yep. We still want to. We use don't want to use Elmer's glue. Technically, no. we could, but we definitely don't right, want to do right. that. Right. Right. So we refer. What we typically will do in wood and also composite construction is use two-part epoxy right. adhesives. Exactly. And one of the adhesives we're using today is actually comes from the boat building industry because they've been putting together wooden boats with epoxy for, for a long, long a time. Long time, long, long absolutely. Time, yes, and, and so it's tried and true in that regard. Right. And they've right. got some good specs on it. It just mm -hmm. hasn't gotten that FAA it approval. It hasn't gone through the, the FAA approval, yeah. And, yeah. And, the, and mostly the reason why is because um, repeatability. Yeah. You know, because the FAA doesn't know how you're working in your shop and I'm working in my shop and, and they just haven't done the research to really refine those parameters. And there's too many variables. You there's have temperature, many, humidity, yeah, yeah. how the person mix it. Yeah. So now there have been cases where people have on an individual basis have gotten approvals for repairs using epoxies on standard category airplanes, but they have to go through a bunch of approval process. They have to make test coupons yeah. and they have to uh, put a lot of data together for the FAA to The good news those. in our world, the experimental in the home -built world, world doesn't have to worry about yeah. that. And, and believe me, Lots and lots of home-built airplanes have been held together by uh, the two-part epoxies, yeah. including some very, very high-performance aerobatic aircraft oh, that sure. are put under stresses that most of our home builds will never see, yeah. and the epoxy works just So fine. definitely the two-part epoxy is kind of the, the, the path to go yeah, through. It's, it's yeah, it's really the best way to go for a home So build. when we're gluing, before we mix the, and talk about the epoxy mm -hmm. and mixing and stuff, we actually have to prep the wood a bit mm -hmm. to make sure the epoxy adhesive uh, adheres right. to it. And the reason why is... Uh, the plywood especially, mm -hmm. there's such a smooth surface. Yeah, there's nothing nothing there for it to grip. You gotta get a little mechanical surface, so yeah. I have some sandpaper. Yeah, so what I would do is on the side that I'm going to put my uh, adhesive, yeah. I would just, just real simply just rub that over that just a little and bit. Break the surface. And all, yeah, all I'm doing is giving a little bit of mechanical teeth for that uh, epoxy for to that epoxy to, to uh, hold on to. Yep. So, in fact, I've got it good enough now that I can't even slide it on the paper anymore. So it must <laughs> be good enough. So I would do that, and I would do that with each of these. I'm going to take it just just rough it up a little bit. Doesn't take much. You just need to get a few grooves in that smooth surface there to yep. give that epoxy some purchase. So I just uh, it'd be easier if I did this before I cut these little pieces. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea. Each one is going to be slightly roughed up on the backside yeah. so that uh, so that we have a, a purchase area. There we yep. go. That's a good one. There we go. So we prepped our, our yep. parts, and yep. now we're ready to glue, right? Yep, exactly. So we need to mix our epoxy. Yeah, so uh, depending on the epoxy you use, there might be varying different ratios. Now we're going to use this T88, T88, which is a one to one. This is a very popular epoxy very that's popular used epoxy, for wood yeah. construction. Yeah, mm -hmm. T88 is one to one. West Systems, I think, is three to one. Yeah. So you look at your manufacturer's instructions on your epoxy that you're using and make sure you use the proper proportions right. so that you got a good, strong bond. What's nice about the T88 is the mix that it is. It has enough viscosity that doesn't flow out of the joint. Exactly. And that's what one, also one of the reasons why it's being used. So what we have here is we have our actual epoxy, the, 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 the structural part, and then we have the um, activator or the... Uh, hardener. Hardener, that's the yeah. word. I'm glad you knew so that. So we have the resin and the hardener. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so with the two-part epoxies, with any epoxies, you want to make sure you protect yourself. That's correct, yep. So we have gloves that we're going to put on. You want to mechanically provide a barrier to the epoxy not getting on your skin because the epoxy can sensitize you you can get a, an allergic reaction it can be as simple as a rash or it can be worse than that mm -hmm. and it's a cumulative effect so you want to be careful about using the epoxies that's not to say that the, it's really dangerous stuff but just just common sense uh, you know you don't want to rub it all over your hands it's just like you um, know you don't want to some people mess around with some it. people get a reaction right away you know as as with all allergies everybody yeah. has their own level so some people will be sensitized to it right away some people never get sensitized to it but usually if you work with it enough you get that cumulative effect and sooner or later if you keep 
keep getting it on your hands, you're going to end up developing a sensitivity to yeah. it. So you just protect yourself from that and you won't have a problem. So when mixing the epoxies, mm -hmm. a typical way to mix it is to pour by eyeing it out, mm -hmm. a little bit of the A part, a little bit of the B part, yep. and then mixing it with a popsicle stick in a, a little, cup, little paper cup, cup container. Yeah. In fact, I did a uh, recent Hints for Home Builders on how to proportion a little more accurately mm -hmm. if you want to. But yeah. this is a typical way. You have a little bit different, and yeah. I think it's a little easier yeah. way to all, mix it. So tell us how that works. All I do is I take a, a piece of paper, a piece of cardboard, a paper plate, whatever you have. You yeah, just non, sure. non Paper plate would be great. Non-coated paper. You don't want anything with wax coating or anything like that on That's it. That's really important yeah. because and the even wax. With your even with your cup, you want an un untreated bare paper cup yeah. or just like I've got otherwise a, the epoxy doesn't stick right it gets it contaminates the yeah. epoxy so so I just uh, literally a piece of paper here that I've got okay and since we know we want a one-to-one -one ratio exactly I'm gonna pop my cap open on my resin and get some down into the into the spigot there so I get a good lung and I'm just gonna draw a line that long okay, okay? simple as that now I'm gonna take my hardener and pop the cap open on that, and I'm going to get some down into the nozzle there, so I'm ready to squirt, and I'm going to draw a line. And because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, the, <coughs> the lines are the same length. Yep, and you just make two, you know. two lines right next to each other the same length, and now you know that you have the appropriate amount of material there, yep. and all we have to do is mix it together. So I just take my little popsicle stick here, and I just literally stir them together. Now you notice the resin was kind of a dark amber color and my hardener was a clear color. So I can use that to watch it mix together and it'll get a little bit lighter amber and all you're doing is really looking for the time when you don't have any just amber or just clear yep. left. So you just basically just mix it up like this. You don't need to stir like crazy. You don't need to get a bunch of air bubbles in it. Those will work their way out if you do anyway. But you just, just want to mix it thoroughly. Yep, yeah, just want to, and it's going to turn into a kind of a milky tan. Okay. Yeah. Once you got that, you can you kind of stir it up. There's a little bit of white left right there. We'll get that out of there, and then we're all set to go. There's and your, this isn't like five minute epoxy. No, you do have you some do have working some time, time yeah, to some time. mix it. If it's, really, if it's really hot, it'll cure a little bit faster. If it's really cold, it'll take a little bit longer, yeah. but it'll finally cure either way. And there we go. Now we've got a kind of a nice light colored tan, yeah. very evenly distributed, all ready to go. So now we're ready for our epoxy. So here's a little trick. We, need, we talked about treatment earlier, Yes. about preserving this wood. Yes. All of these little gussets have little pockets behind them. Of course, we're gonna, like you see on this rib, it's got a gusset on both sides. Right. So you got these little pockets down in here um, that it's really hard to get yeah. varnish down in there. Um, we can go to the camera number three. You might be able to see that just a little better, that kind of pocket there. So we have to get, protect yeah, you the want, in, you interior get, surface here. Yeah, the easiest way to do that when you're putting a gusset on is just coat the entire back side of the gusset with your epoxy. And it's already taken care of. And, and so you don't have to worry about, did I get enough varnish down in there? Did sure. I miss a spot? Is there yep. still, you know, just, just take, your, take your stick and take your gusset, and I'm just gonna use my popsicle stick. I'm just gonna spread a nice, thin, even coat of epoxy on the back of that gusset, covering the whole gusset. Nice and thin, don't need a lot, yeah. just a little bit. And it's protecting it, and then it's also gonna be the adhesive yep, bond. Exactly. For the the uh, squeeze off the extra there. Cap strips. So now we know that, uh, and here's another thing that I've found out is make sure you know which location you're doing because there's a spar going to go through this. Yeah. So, so you, you don't want to put this on like that because you know you're going to have a problem. You need to remember where you're at and put yep. it on in the appropriate and, and place. And the jig is helpful there because we actually it's have already, spar yeah. opening written down. So, so it, now I've got it positioned. But I need to hold it there because it's still, I mean, I can move that all over because that uh, epoxy is still in you know, a more or less a liquid form or yes. vis viscous form. Right. So there's uh, the old world way was with little bitty nails. Yeah, you'd tiny a nails. A bunch of little bitty nails and a little bitty hammer and you'd be in there with, you know, several nails. Yep. With the advent of handheld staplers, it's made our life a lot yeah. easier. So that all, just, this is just a hardware yep, store stapler. A hardware store stapler with some quarter inch quarter staples. Inch staples. Yeah. And I just want to make sure I'm kind of right in the middle of that piece of wood there. There you go. Fire a staple in that one. I'm going to fire another one in this diagonal here. 
Now beyond the hand operated staplers, some people will use air driven or electric staplers and sometimes even a, a little more fancy upholstery right. stapler that has a tiny, exactly. tiny staple. Now the thing you have to remember is that these staples are not adding structural strength. They're not there to hold the aircraft it's together. It's just a clamp, giving you some clamping force yeah. for the epoxy uh, to cure and it also keeps the part from moving around while the epoxy is curing. Sure. Uh, if you really want to get fussy about weight, you can literally go after all this epoxy is cured, you can go and pull those uh, pull the staples, staples out. back out before you put your varnish on sure and you've not done anything to the strength of the part at all and you've saved yourself a little bit of weight I yeah. mean it doesn't sound like much but if you got a large airplane with a lot of staples in it it can add up to a little right uh, a and then and ultimately too the staples would probably start corroding and yep. make yep. a mess so it's probably a good idea to take them out yeah so here's our other do number two number two here and again with just a nice thin coat you don't need much just enough to give it a coating and then we will put that on our Number two section here. Yeah. There you go. Make sure to leave our opening open for our spar. Fire a staple in it there. Staple in it there. Locked in place. And now that epoxy will cure and that part will be ready to go. Let's do one more, like sure. number two here. Yep. And do that one. Again, I've already roughed this up. You saw me doing yep. that before. And put just a little bit of epoxy on there. Coat the whole back side so that we know that that's protected uh, for uh, our environmental uh, issues later on. That one just goes right over there. I'm going to put a staple on the on the laundry or on the cap strip here, and I'll put one on the upright as well. There you go. And we continue on with this process. Yeah, and then you'd make, you know, you'd, you'd have to put this other diagonal in there before you put this gusset on because that has to cover both of those diagonals. Getting all the joints glued in place properly. Exactly. Now, what happens is that this is one side. Right. Now, you notice that on our finished rib, you've got gussets, gussets on, on both sides. So yeah. what you do is you, you put this in the jig, you staple it together, you get it all uh, in there and it's all curing. And you leave it cure enough that you can pull it out of the of the jig. Yep. And then you uh, would flip it over, and now it doesn't need to be in the jig because all the parts are held in place. Sure. You can just put the gussets on the other side. Yep. And then set that aside and, and repeat right. the process. And for what a lot of a lot of builders right. I've talked to uh, when they're in the in the rib building part of their project is they would get up in the morning and put one rib in the jig, put your gussets on, come home at noon, pull that one out do the other side of it, put another one in the jig, put the gussets on, and then come home in the evening, pull that one out, and they made two ribs. And just keep and, on going. Yeah, and it didn't, didn't even take any, hardly any time out of their day to And do suddenly it. they have a pile of ribs, which they can continue on to the next step. Exactly. Yeah. So, really simple process. Of course, if we were building this rib, I would have put some adhesive on this joint, and there's a gusset that actually goes on that joint as sure. well. Sure, right. And then all the way back to the... I mean, to well, the, yeah, ultimately there's a whole bunch of gussets, yep. a whole bunch of joints that we'd bond together. Exactly. But just to give you an example of the processes involved. Right, exactly. So we have the these ribs done now we talked about the, the really important part protecting it right exactly so we have to do something to coat that to preserve the wood after your structure is all completed and you've got all your joints glued and everything is all uh, in more or less the finished product you're going to want to protect that with some sort of a, a varnish or an epoxy uh, an epoxy varnish or a spar varnish what they used to call spar varnish which is out of the the, uh, the, the marine industry yeah again. sure mm -hmm. uh, some waterproof weatherproof varnish material that you'll coat the whole thing so that no moisture or any other contaminants can get in there once the structure is complete. Sure. And a lot of times they're using a two-part epoxy varnish right. uh, to protect that. And a good point on that, uh, Mark, is that this is ultimately going to get covered with fabric. Right. And you've got a fabric covering process, which we're going to talk about in another segment here later on. Yes. Um, those fabrics are chemicals as well. Yeah, and, and they have solvents in And they in have them. solvents in those, so you need to make sure that you know what covering process you're gonna use and use whatever they recommend. So you gotta think a couple steps ahead right. to make sure you're using the proper products and right. as the underlying And, and if you're building a, you know, a wood wing airplane with a tube and fabric fuselage, you also have to think about that for your, for your structure of your tubing. You know, yeah. What type of a, a primer of do coating, they want yeah. on that? to be compatible with the adhesives that they're going to use in the covering process. Sure. So it's always good to think ahead and, okay, I'm going to use the, the stitch process or the polyfiber process. Yeah. If you go in the polyfiber manual, it's got a whole list of, you know, for your metal, you want to use this. For the wood, you want to use this. Yeah. And that way you know that you're not going to have an incompatibility of, of your different processes. Yep. 
So it makes it pretty simple that way. But exactly. you absolutely have to preserve it. Yeah. And when you do preserve it, you've got a structure that's going to last for many, many, decades many years. and decades. And you know, just yep. going back to that travel air example. Yep. Many, many, many. Even years. using the what what I we could almost call primitive materials back mm -hmm. then, real early design, uh, uh, chemistries yep. as far as yep. varnishes and protective materials, they lasted have lasted long, all long time. that long, long, time. long yeah. time. Yeah. So so yeah. So again. Um, the whole idea is to read the instructions and read all your manuals and, and study up ahead of time so that you know uh, what process you're supposed to use, what material you're supposed to use, and how to treat those materials sure. in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. So what do you think is the hardest part of this? You know, as a person <laughs> building a wood structure or, or building a wood airplane, going into it, you know, obviously the tools aren't that challenging no, no. the the basics cutting and things aren't what's what's the hardest there part? really isn't any hard part to it uh, from a building standpoint <laughs> quite frankly the hardest part I find is after a home builder does this gorgeous job on their wood I mean it's just beautiful woodwork yeah and then they have to cover it up with fabric and they just hate to cover up that work that they've all this time they've spent building this gorgeous wood structure it looks great and now it gets covered up yeah and that's the hardest part is hiding all that great work that you've done well it, you know it is really an art Form. Very much. I've walked through our museum many times and looked at the Jenny that's uncovered. Oh yeah. And if you look the the interior structure of the Jenny and and many wood type mm -hmm. airplanes like that, it's beautiful. The structure yeah. there is just a, something to behold. Yeah, I've actually had uh, people that are you know into the wood building and they get something that really is that pretty. They'll say, boy, I wish they had a clear fabric that you could put on this thing so that you could still see that wood <laughs> see structure what's going on, yeah. when the aircraft is flying because they yeah. just hate to cover up all that wonderful work that they've exactly. done. Exactly. So taking the next steps, obviously if you're buying a kit, uh, the, the kit is going to have step-by-step -step instructions on mm -hmm. how to go through this process. Right. If you're trying to recreate a legacy airplane, maybe with plans from the 1920s, right. which some people still do, oh, absolutely. Uh, you're not going to have instructions to do that. No. So in terms of building up your techniques. One is practicing. Yep. I mean, as simple as constructing a, a practice a, jig, a practice yeah. jig, and you know, just make just some parts. Make yeah. some parts. Yeah. And you can get these materials in small quantities, so right. you don't have to buy a gallon's worth of adhesive. Right. You can buy little pint small jars containers, and, and right. most of the other stuff is and of course, available. If it's something that you're just new to, this is the perfect time to use your EAA network. Talk to your yeah. local chapter, your EAA technical counselors. Um, they're all there. It's all part of the EA family. They're there to help you. They want to help you. They volunteered to, to be, uh, you know, advisors for people that are just getting started. Yeah. And they'll be happy to come over and kind of give you a little primer on what you're looking forward to, what you're going to do, how to get your shop set up. Uh, you know, maybe they'll suggest a couple of tools that you might not have and just really help you get started. So use those EAA um, facilities like yeah. that. The, the amazing, the EA community is an amazing group of folks. Yeah. Folks that are members of chapters, you mentioned the tech counselors, yes. which are folks that have built airplanes and yeah. essentially you can get connected with them and they'll draw, mentor yeah. your work looking over your shoulder. Yeah, they'll draw on their knowledge to help you build your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is of course our uh, Hints for Home Builders videos. Yeah. Hints for Home We've Builders, we have over 500 right lots now. Lots and lots of Hints for Home Builders videos on a broad spectrum of building subjects, including woodworking and sheet metal and welding and all the other uh, things that come into building various types of home-built aircraft yep. those are all free on the EA website just go on there and look up whatever subject matter you're looking for and, and they're there for your for your viewing exactly and we have some other resources as well we have actually a specific book on wood aircraft construction and one of the neat things that I was just delving into just recently when I was researching a project is sport aviation sport aviation magazine is online yep. you can type in a couple of key search terms and come up with all the different articles that were written from when it originally was published in 1953 through up. today. <clears throat> and there's some amazing information and content that really takes deep dives into building jigs yep. and fixtures, right. techniques for cutting wood uh, parts, right. uh, an amazing amount of stuff that is beyond just what we can stick in a book. Yep. And that's a great resource as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, don't forget about our aviation information services. Those are folks right here at EA, live people that are builders and pilots that will answer your technical questions by phone or by email, and they'd be delighted to help you out in just about any way they can. Absolutely, yep. Well, that's about it for now. Yep. 
Thanks for being a part of this workshop week as we continue with our EA Together, the Spirit of Aviation Week. My name is Mark Force. I'm Joe Norris. And we'll be back this afternoon talking about fabric construction and again tomorrow wrapping up our amazing week here at EA and Oshkosh with some other great home building topics. All the presentations that we've done so far this week are also available on demand, so check the eatogether.org website for that. Thanks again. We'll see you later on. Bye-bye. With plenty of